The HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast is powered by Gornerstone Gundog Academy. CGA is the world's most comprehensive online gun dog training resource. They've got over 160 instructional videos that includes everything you need to take your seven-week-old puppy to a finished gun dog. Visit cornerstonegundogacademy.com to sign up for the free preview module and begin your training journey today. Cornerstone Gun Dog Academy, the most advanced gun dog training resource on the web. You are listening to the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast. <laughs> Out in the field, how you've prepared determines how you'll perform. With balanced fat and protein to support peak condition, Yukonuba Premium Performance Dog Food enhances strength, energy, and endurance. So when the pavement ends and the truck doors swing open, you and your dogs are ready for anything. Strong, focused, ready for anything, that's a Yukonuba dog. Since 1898, Old Town has been building the most advanced, quality watercraft products to give you the very best experience on the water. Whether you're hunting, fishing, or enjoying a relaxing paddle on the lake, there's a boat for every type of adventure. If you haven't seen it, check out their newest offering, the new grab-and-go watercraft designed to function as your boat, blind, and retriever. The easy-to-conceal, 11-foot, 9-inch, 56-pound, solo sportsman is the ideal craft for those in search of a stable, lightweight craft that's easy to paddle and even easier to transport or stash. Designed with the hunter and angler in mind, the solo sportsman is equipped with thoughtful shell, tackle, and tool storage, a comfortable and adjustable seat and foot braces, an accessory track, and rod holders. Check it out at oldtownscanoe.com forward slash sportsman. Soundgear is offering a 35% discount to the HP Outdoors listeners for their instant fit industrial and shooter products. You can head over to soundgearhearing.com and use the promo code HPO35 to claim your discount today. Original design, select grade components, superior sound, and unparalleled service. 737 take exceptional pride in producing the finest quality, best built premium calls on the market today. They're made right here in America, and they're offered only direct to consumers through their website. Shipping in the U.S. is always free, and international orders are also accepted online. A 20-day money-back guarantee and lifetime warranty accompanies every call purchased. 737 Duck Calls. Lead the flock. Lifetime Decoy's new Flex Float Mallard Decoy set the new standard for quality and durability in waterfowl decoys. An EVA foam, open-bottom construction combined with patent-pended dual-flow swim keel system allows for more movement and less wind, the ability to sit flat on ice and dirt, and virtually indestructible design which can be shot or otherwise punctured and still float. Each decoy weighs only 11 ounces with the self-riding keel weights removed or 19 ounces with the weights installed. Check them out today at lifetimedecoys.com. All right, welcome to episode 184 of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast. We're your on-demand source for all things waterfowl and waterfowl hunting. If you're new to the show, you can check us out at hpoutdoors.com. You can find us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you're a Facebook user, you can head over to our listeners group. You can join, I think it's almost 9,000 other waterfowl hunters right at this point. Talking all things waterfowl. You can also link up with my co-host, Dan Harushki in there. Dan, what's up? Yeah, man. And, you know, we have the the monthly banner contest. And the people that are coming out of the woodwork with awesome photos that – uh I get to choose like the top 15 out of 300 pictures is impossible, but they're getting better from when we started it. I think we started over three years ago and, and it's people are doing really, really great jobs. So, you know, let's uh, come over and chat and join in. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good, it's a good opportunity for uh, new hunters and experienced hunters alike. A lot of great information shared in there. Um, if you're, finding us via the Facebook group, which a lot of guys do I'm finding out, uh, you know, you can find our show on YouTube, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, all the good spots where podcasts are found. You can find our show. And if you've been listening to our show for a while, uh, perhaps maybe all the way back to almost the beginning, <laughs> we've, got, we've got a guest joining us this week who, Dan, I think the first time we had him on the show, I want to say it was like 2000, was it 2014? I just it wrote it down. Episode yeah. 14, December 1st, 2014. Yeah, nice. yeah, a long time ago. And yeah, it has uh, been a we're while. excited to welcome back, and it's probably well overdue at this point. Uh, Jim Sabir, the Sitka Waterfowl guru, uh, all things gear, is with us this week to talk about a lot of different things. Uh, we're excited to have you back, Jim. Welcome. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, it's been yeah. quite some time since I was on 
it's yeah. always it's always interesting when we get a guest on and we you know we're doing kind of like we're chatting before we start recording and I know we're always in for a good one when I, when I have to say like, we're going to save this for the recording because we, <laughs> we just start chatting and we get all these good stories. I know. Going and I'm like, yeah. this is the kind of stuff we want to make sure we record. So we did that. So I think we saved uh, some really, some really good stuff that we're going to cover this week and, you know, um, Sitka, uh, Sitka gear and Sitka products and all things Sitka is one of the, um, most frequently discussed things in our in our Facebook group uh, without question people always have questions about how should they develop their system and what's the right pieces for the conditions they hunt and nice. all of those things and you know we're excited because we're about to get a glimpse into the the new product offerings for this year from Sitka in the waterfowl category which is always uh, something good and we're also getting some updates to some some pieces that are that are you know really uh some of our favorites and, and things that we we like to use so we're looking forward to talking in, uh about all of those things uh but before we do um what's been going on man i mean we we shared some really interesting you shared some stuff with, that was kind of blowing my mind a little bit when we were getting started here with some 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 personal things you've taken on with your shotgun and oh yeah um, you know and you're you're an expert level skeet shooter now and you're <laughs> and I never said like, that. There's, a, there's a lot a lot to unpack yeah. right there so um, yeah just catch us up man what's been going on in the, over the last uh Gosh. Like six years since we've had you on the show <laughs> yeah uh shoot six years in montana feels like a lifetime uh <laughs> yeah my my kids are growing up and moving out and I'm getting to spend time doing some things that, that, you know, I used to do and uh, love the outdoors, all things outdoors between fishing and shooting and hunting and motorcycles. And yeah, just, just what a wonderful uh, place it is to, to live and, and enjoy those things. Um, I gotta say, I'm always jealous lot. of, you know, you and, um, Matt McCormick and Ted Wells and the guys that we know they're out there in Montana and Brady Davis, you know, the photos that come out and just like, you know, mm. things that people on the East coast have to like take vacation days to get to do. Yeah. You guys just pop out for like an afternoon and it's like, like, yeah, you know, just amazing out there. So it's really awesome to see you guys and all the, the cool things you get to go into and uh, definitely a little jealous on for me who, you know, suburbia life these days. Uh, it's quite different here in Virginia. Yeah. Than it seems like in Montana, maybe a little bit. Maybe a little. <laughs> <laughs> it's really cold. I'm going to encourage everybody to realize, you know, our, we've got uh, winter and then an extra dose of winter. And then we have a little bit of summer where winter might happen at the same time. And so <laughs> season's short. Let's be careful. Yeah. <laughs> but, but no. So Jim, the other... Hey, the other day, um, my neighbor came up and it's actually my, my wife's friend and they have, they bought a new side by side and uh, yeah. I was like, man, I need a side by side so bad. And like three days later we go down to their house and her husband it, has a boot on he's walking around and I was like, what is going on, man? He, he's like, well, I jumped on my son's uh, dirt bike and I broke my ankle. I was like, did you not just get a brand new side by side three days ago? And then the next thing I know, I see you on your Instagram riding dirt bikes up mountains. I was like, Ooh, <laughs> so yeah. what's uh, oh, how yeah. long you been doing that? And, and what are you getting into there? Gosh, you know, I, I growing up um, in Maryland, you know, and, and I rode motorcycles since I was 20. So what's that? 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I you know I accumulated gosh at over a hundred thousand street miles on motorcycles so rode a lot and not didn't do a whole lot of off-road stuff but both my brothers raced and did a lot of enduros and hair scrambles and those kinds of things and I was always around the dirt bikes just you know the way things worked I just never got into that I came out here and I, I, you know, I thought it'd be nice to do some trails and had a dual sport and, and just didn't ride it much. And then we had a, a an instigator join the Sitka crew, mm -hmm. uh, a guy I refer to as JJ. And he is uh, an ex pro motocross, you know, racing kind of guy and just kind of taunted uh, a couple of us into getting into it. And, here, here we are. This is year two. 
year two and, and after the first ride of the season, I literally couldn't go up or down stairs. My, my quads were killing me. I was, my hands were cramping, you know, so um, getting a good dose of it and really enjoy it. But uh, the trails and the mountains and things that we're seeing just makes it spectacular. So, yeah. You run into any grizzlies up there? Uh, not not uh, on the motorcycle so much. I do, I do hunt um, – early archery season for elk with my two brothers from the East coast and my best friend, they come out every year. So we have an annual, um, elk camp and it is populated <laughs> with grizzlies and, and yeah. it makes it pretty, uh, pretty exciting. We have been very fortunate. Uh, the only bear interaction that we've had that's been uh, problematic was actually a big black bear and, and, um, yeah, we still talk about why we didn't shoot that one when we had the opportunity with the tag in our pocket and in the, in the follow-up. Oh, wow. mm. uh, no, so we've been pretty fortunate, but, you know, grizzlies and, and their populations and density certainly are growing, and it's a, it's a thing. I'm, I imagine, Dan, if you ran into a grizzly out there, you would uh, soil your Sitka Merino boxers pretty quickly, <laughs> wouldn't you? Yeah, well, <laughs> but the thing is, they, they would dry super quick, and... <laughs> <laughs> you know <laughs> probably yeah. i just wash them in a stream they'd be That's dry right. in, the no beauty of in a matter of minutes yeah. yeah i mean jim i don't know if you know this but dan is dan's nickname is dan marino because he just That's champions nice. the benefits of marino wool from the mountaintops for all uh, to hear <laughs> i you know i love that i love i, I wear marino boxers every day yeah, yeah. So I, I'm all fist bump right there. Oh, oh. Okay. <laughs> fist bump. Nice. <laughs> we just, that might be my first garage. one of those on a podcast. That's right. Hey, <laughs> I think that's the first one Dan's given out. That's, that's, a, that's nice. hard to come by. That's, those are not earned. Yeah. No, nope. not earned easily. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's talk a little bit. So, you know, I know this is an important time <laughs> of year for, for Sitka gear and, and everything getting ready to roll out. And yeah. I can't help but think like what's the discussions like in the, in the boardroom, in the war room, when you're talking about like design ideas and, mm -hmm. you know, cause I, I mean, I, I can only relate it to my, my normal life, but I sit at work and I sit at meetings sometimes and people are, they'll say something. And I think in my head, that's a dumb idea. And, but you know, <laughs> you gotta be tactful and uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. But I, I know, obviously, um, the guys, you know, the folks that worked at Sitka are probably all very like-minded and, and things. So I, I imagine it more, there's like a case of bush light on the table and everyone's kind of like oh, just no, talking. But no. like, how, how did these decisions get made? I mean, how yeah. do those conversations go? Like, how does the, you know, how does the sausage get made in that room when you're talking about just the different, you know, the different concepts and ideas that sort of get thrown around? How does that all go down? Right. I think it's really important that we clarify something right up front. There's no bush light to be found in the, in, in the Sitka office that I'm aware of. We oh. at development always have bourbon on hand. Oh, uh, okay. The, I'm, I think it's much preferred the brown inspiration. <laughs> and, Fair enough. Yeah. So, the so brown water. But, uh, you know, with, we have an incredible team. And with the kind of depth and experience and personalities that we have, man, we have great, healthy debate. And, and I mean, in the mornings, you know, I typically get to work when we were allowed to go to the office. You know, I get to work <laughs> at 7 a.m. And for the first <clears throat> half hour to an hour every morning, you know, we would kind of huddle around the table and, and it was, it was really that timing and that time of day where, where we do, you know, some of our, our best thinking and our, our discussions and we really kind of, we get after it pretty strong, right in it, right out of the gate. So that, that, you know, I, th I think, um, I don't know that, that bad ideas exist in certainly, Gosh, I try and keep an open mind because I'm certainly not the smartest guy in the room um, on, on a lot of these topics, um, certainly in waterfowl and my space and, and, and 
the things that that I do champion waiters those kinds of things for sure but insulation um, you know base layers of moisture management and uh, just different different parts of our business and and we just have a great team and and I would say the synergies run really strong so how how does that whole how does it all work now that you're not allowed to go into the office do you guys have calls yeah. do you like yeah I, that has to be one of the biggest disruptions and just before we got on this call I was thinking to myself I was like man like it's such a build up to a release and you have to get semi nervous or I'd be nervous if it was you know the last three months have been out of the ordinary to where everything's checked but I, I know it's taken care of yeah but it's just a different situation than you're than you're used to yeah it's it's been quite challenging in regard to the personal interactions and and a lot of phone calls a lot of video conferencing a lot of you know we even have had several meetings where, you know, we manage the space and distance, but we still get together around fire, you know, when was a recent example where, nice. you know, I was on the team hosted us over to his place and, and we sat around a fire at distance and all the chairs were spaced and, you know, we were very considerate of each other's space and samples. And, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to replace, the personal interactions and, and, you know, that's a big part of uh, who I am and, and probably why I like waterfowl hunting so much more than sitting in a tree stand. Yeah. I hear that. Um, let's, we talked about this before we got on, but I, I think it's an interesting perspective and I'd like to you know have you share it with our audience. Um, you know, typically in the industry, you know, we're used to seeing pieces coming out at shot show and sure. all of these shows and stuff like that. And that's, that's commonly when it comes out. Um, mm -hmm. this year obviously, um, has been different, uh, in, in, in the sense that, you know, a lot of those shows, um, I think, I think uh, some of them probably, you know, still happen, but I don't think, um, I don't know if all of them necessarily did or if they were as attended yeah. as well, or, you know, kind of, there's been, there was a little bit of a, a shift sort of, it felt like in the, in the market space. And now, you know, companies are finding like, you can't. You're there, I mean, if you've, if they've not embraced social media and the ability to connect virtually with the customer by this point, like they're going to have a very difficult time, you know, yeah, surviving so. in the, what, who knows what will be our new normal, whatever. But like, you know, that's something that, uh, you know, Sitka has always done a really nice job of in, 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 uh, the social arena. Uh, so talk a little bit about sort of your guys, your approach to how you're handling this release this year and, and, mm -hmm. and with the challenges that are, you're being dealt your way, how you guys are overcoming that. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I would say that, that our approach to this year was, was formulated before any of the events and, and even the shows came around. Our planning had went back much further than that. Um, and, and, and really just trying to, to be aware of when things are relevant to consumers and having a really sharp focus on, you know, our consumer interactions. So just as you alluded to, you know, how do we, how do we give information and when's appropriate and, you know, launching products, you know, six months before any season or, or availability, you know, isn't exactly a great approach, you know, so you know, taking some of that noise and, and then driving that in a meaningful way. So we can start talking about products when it's applicable and when people can find those products at their retailer or on our website and, and really embrace the, the timing uh, appropriately. So, you know, we're just now getting ready to launch all of our fall products for waterfowl next week. You know, so in the next, you know, seven to 10 days, um, these things are going to be available and, and it's the same for retailers. You know, they're going to have them at the same time. Um, so timing wise, this is great for us to talk about these new products and, and hopefully people will be excited because it's otherwise there's that hangover effect. You kind of launch it in January and then you come around to fall. People are like, well, what's new? <laughs> well, yeah. we no, I, I mean, I think that's absolutely, that. absolutely the case. And, you know, you get excited and you see these things, bumping around on uh, 
social media. Yeah. You know, some, someone's got like a grainy side photo of like this music oh, uh, thing right? at the show that they, you're like, well, what's <laughs> that? Like, is that a pocket or like, is there, it, does it have, you know, so there's like all this, but then like no one can get their hands on them for months. And it's right. like, you know, um, it, it's a, a little bit of that, the momentum that you build there is lost. And I mean, Dan and I can attest, our, 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 we see it in our show numbers. Um, the summer goes crazy. Like, like from here till yeah. September, will be some of the highest numbers we'll see all year because yeah. people are getting sick of heat making plans. They want, they want to get into the fall and they're looking forward to it and they're, and they're yep. looking for their stuff. So I think it's a, I think it's a brilliant move on your guys's part. And um, you know, we even talked about it before we got on here, Dan, nor Dan, Dan, nor I know much about what are the new yeah. products are. And I mean, if anybody knows Dan would know, I mean, he's got like, yeah. like I think he's got, you know, he's got like, Oh, yeah. recruited spies at Sitka that he just he needs to feel it and he's got That's nothing right. so we're pumped to hear what you're going to tell us today <laughs> That's right I heard Ford's getting ready to launch their new F150 and I had no idea <laughs> I did see that too but hey uh, right um, I just I bought before, an F150 you know in December now look there's a new one <laughs> There's a new one it's slick too um so before we get into some of the product and you were talking about, you know, planning and um, just thinking about yeah. what hunts do you have coming up? Are you worried about travel? Are you going to Canada? I'm supposed to be going to Saskatchewan so in September. So I, I don't think it's going <laughs> to yeah, happen. I don't not. think the board Dan, is going to happen. you're not going. No. You're going to have to I come know. to Montana. <laughs> tough, tough side tough, uh, to tough that. alternative yeah uh yeah so yeah. i've been i've been going to canada at least once a year for the last six years five years anyway and and um i plan to be in canada in october i i really think that's not gonna happen so yeah. you know it's it's just a matter of uh the situation right now i don't think the border's gonna open and if it does i'm not sure that um, not sure whether my group will even get to go. So right now it's up in the air. We've got it penciled in on the calendar and man, we've been going to the same location. We, it's all DIY. We do our own thing. We go to the same properties and, you know, we've got methodology built into, you know, this DIY hunt every year and we look forward to it. So that's going to be a tough one for me. I Yeah, not about that news. There, I think I'm Dan's internet in. is is currently oh, striking. It's uh, it's typical move where we have no idea what he just said. Go ahead and say it again. <laughs> I see him now. I said, I said, I think I'm frozen. I'll just wait a second. Yeah. But, we, well, we can but, um, confirm that that Montana has better internet than Linesville, Pennsylvania. That, that's confirmed. Mm, it doesn't not, matter. Not we had it doesn't question. matter where you're at. Every place on the it doesn't matter. You, you just jinxed me for sure. Mine's gonna lock up. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so about something how, new. With, uh, with, uh, without all those hunters going up there, how do you think the flight will be in the fall in the United States? Gosh, you know, that, that's a tough one. And, and you, 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 I think that reality is birds get hunted up north first. And certainly that, that you know, impact, um, is is there but i don't i really don't know that it's going to make a difference it's hard for me to hard for i mean i don't know what their harvest is in canada i see a lot of people when we're up there but it's so big and wide open spaces and you know look at the snow geese population up there i mean we're not putting a dent in those even with an old year so I don't know. I, I don't, I don't know that it'll, that it'll matter that anybody will, will take notice along the flyway. It'd be interesting though. We'll see. Yep. I don't think the Canadian um, locals are hunting. I, it doesn't seem like a very, um, it seems like there's a lot more people coming up from the U S than there are uh, yeah. hunting in Canada for one reason or another. All right, let's let's talk product a little bit. And yeah, what would you? I'd like to start with what product or what piece um, that you're most excited about. Gosh, 
you know, I spent so much time on the development of all these products, you know, and, and I guess the one that I'm most excited about, you know, I, we'll, we'll talk about the waiter update. Um, you know, we've got some new styles um, that support a, a waiter, a healthy waiter system that I'll, that I'll talk about that I'm pretty excited about. And, you know, I, I, we came up with an idea to, to store your waiters and not, let's not say store, but carry your waiters to and fro and, and how to manage these things. And because I travel a lot um, and I take waiters with me and you hunt right up to the end, you take these wet waiters and you throw them in your, your, you know, your big bag and it's just a, it's just a, a waiter soup. You know, mm-hmm. eating in the yeah. bottom of your luggage. And so I wanted to create a, a product that would help contain these waders, no zippers, um, you know, and the premise was similar to our whitetail launch pad is, you know, now I can stand by the boat ramp and put my waders on and take them off and, and put them in this origami folding uh, wader bag that when, when you see it and you get to experience it and understand um, just the, the simple designs and the elegance of what this thing is, um, that's, that's the one I think that's the most interesting and, and different. Um, Built-in boot jack that I, I want to tell you, we, we did 3D print, man, I don't know, three, four, five different versions of this boot jack before we went to build a mold. Um, that's attached to this thing. So, you, you know, no, no more holding on to your buddy while you're trying to kick, <laughs> the boot and, you know, trying to do the, I call it the waiter dance by the truck, mm-hmm. you know, so, so just that and, and, and making it containment, you know, I can yeah. put my, my, my waiters and they fold up into this um, bag I can throw it in my truck and I don't have to worry about the mud. And then when I get it out, I can clean them and hang them up to dry. So, you know, that's a really cool product that I think people are going to be really excited when they see it. Cause um, it, you know, it's pretty neat. So that, that there's, there's so many, I was going to say, there's so many ideas that you guys come up with that there's always a negative side. Like someone's always like, do you really need that? You just bend over, take your, well, once you use it, when you understand how easy it is and just nice to be able to get out of your truck and, and use those or before you get back in your truck. I mean, it's a, am I frozen again? No, you're good. You went robo Dan for just a minute. Just <laughs> robo Dan. Yeah. That's my, Dan, that's my that, new that, nickname. I know Dan, that's a great lead in. And I will tell you that the level of scrutiny that goes into uh, bringing a product through the development cycle at a company like Sika Gear, um, I can assure you that we're solving a problem where it wouldn't be there. You know, we just, um, we're bringing forth fewer products, um, but more more meaningful and thoughtful and filling in. You know, we, we have a tremendous uh, collection. And, you know, I don't, I don't feel a great burden or pressure to just bring new stuff in and, and try and, uh, you know, recreate the wheel. We, when we have a, a real problem that we're trying to solve and that we're, we are incredibly fortunate to have the amazing resources and talent in and around our business to make a dream come to reality. So I can, I can write down this idea on a piece of paper and, together you know what the problem is i'm trying to solve and pass that along to a designer and you know what the ideas that come it's it's not my creation i might manage the problem and and the product and and but but i'm just the team and the talent you know being able to turn around 3d print parts overnight you know and, and we're really trying things you know and they're not full strength but we can actually test things out and, and you're going to see these kinds of things that come around and what we're able to do. It's super impressive. I want to just touch on that real quick. Cause I had the, the opportunity and the pleasure to go out with uh, Chris Derrick. Yes. Who's the whitetail man. He came out to PA Correct. and I did some filming and photography 
with him and uh, Bo Martonic. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he's telling me that some of these bags are, you know, this is the third year he's been working on it. Right. Yeah. And he's like, there's no, there's no pressure to put it out. There's, you know, the pressure is to get it right and to get something yeah. that is exactly what we want. And I think that they're coming out with a big launch on the whitetail side too, because they're, yep. you know, oh. they're excited about what the, yeah, some of the stuff they got is beautiful and yeah. very, you know, useful. But just going back to that, to have those resources at, at the company to not just push out something that you regret after a yeah. launch, you know, you're like, we got it oh, down, yeah. we got it down packed. And that is, yeah, uh, that's irreplaceable, right? Yeah. And, and, and not everything is going to resonate you know, you, you just not, you're not going to have all home runs when you step to the plate, but man, you better have a base hit. You better, you know, and, and I think the, the, the reality is we don't, we don't have to bring things forward and we don't, and the, our, our development process and scrutiny for getting it right is, is, you know, it's, it's not, it's not timeline critical yes we have to hit a timeline if we're going to make it for a season but if it doesn't make it that season we don't bring it forward if it's not ready or right then it's going to push and i and i think that's okay and i think we're you know we're very fortunate to to be in a situation where we've got great products and 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 great collections and and we're going to continue to innovate and i think you're going to see that from us year over year the innovation is going to continue but you know, there's not going to be, you know, a whole new collection or, or, you know, the, is that just not necessary? Yeah. Well, and, and kind of, uh, going along that, that same vein, um, you know, here not long ago, you guys came to market with the ladies line, which I know um, sure. a lot of, a lot of ladies were excited about cause they weren't having to, you know, try to make a, a man, a man's garment work. And sure. uh, I can remember when I hunted with uh, Sierra Langbell out at um, the Beretta Tor- Torture Tour, she had some of the, the uh, yep. lady garments um, on that hunt. And she was just like showing me some of the detail that sort of went into oh. that and, and like how it worked for a lady. And I yeah. was like, I also kept thinking, I was, I was like, I can't imagine how long that was in development. Yeah. Like I just, that had to take a while because it was like really well thought out. And I just, I felt like mm-hmm. it was more than just, you know, it's just cut a little differently. Like to, you know, it's, oh, it's, it's, it's not just that. You have and no that, idea. That was a, yeah. That yeah. was sort of a, a really, um, you know, an eye opener for me when I was like, man, I can't imagine the amount of time that it took to get every yeah. piece that, you know, I, you know, stuff that I've been wearing for years, sure. I'm like they had to strip this down and redesign it to fit a completely different oh. body structure. Like, well, not I mean, it was, absolutely. Well, and, and I had, I had to take a step back, you know, from that. And, and, you know, we brought in a female designer. Um, our, our developer on the project was a female. We brought in a focus group of, of female waterfowl hunters and and really sat down and and i was a facilitator i had to yes i had to be responsible for what came out at the end but you know i I didn't want to i didn't want to be responsible for designing and creating you know women specific here because i can't empathize with their situation and 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 needs nearly as well as they can so that you know really understanding and letting that process really work super exciting results and and you know it was uncomfortable uh if i had to drive all those conversations and you know and the drop seat in the hudson bib i I would have never come up with that now i have guys who are like how come we don't have a drop seat in yeah (laughs) that's really cool yeah when she pointed that they had they mentioned that they had that i was like I can't imagine how that discussion started. Like, you know, it wasn't I, I, mean, my idea. I mean, I could just see Jim being like, Hey, how about a drop yeah. seat there? You know, I'm right. sure it didn't go quite like that. No, no. Sipping his brown water drop seat. Uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Funny. I can't claim credit for that. You know, I, I, I helped see the process, but man, what a good time. <laughs> Yeah. So that was, you know, and I think that's a great example. And that's, and that's how we, we approach things. And, you know, we, we start with, you know, how are we going to go and what's the process going to look like? Um, yeah. And we're, it's, uh, it's been very successful and, and 
each each situation and collection will be approached you know not in in whatever manner you know we see fit for that project and and for that one you know bringing in the that focus group and having a woman designer and a woman developer i'm not saying it was it was critical but it surely helps things and and um you know that was one i took a step back on i i was there for the whole process but where i didn't need to be i excluded myself and ex excused myself and said go for it you know i i don't need to be here for this discussion so i do i do want to take a step back cuz we have since we haven't talked in 6 years um how did the the stretch material in the hudson jacket come about cuz <laughs> that that is one of the most amazing pieces of equipment that i've that i've worn just being able to you know some people like I'm not a huge guy, but decent shoulders to where I'd almost have to size up to get a good swing. Yeah. And now, yeah. you know, getting something that fits correctly and still be able to move and get that shoulder stretch is just, it's unreal. Well, yeah. and, and to tag on with that, it, it seems like with the Hudson redesign launch, both jacket and bibs, at least for me, I was like a size smaller than what I had been traditionally. Like I got XLs and I was like, Am I, am I a large now? Like what's going on? Like, it, it, uh, you know, it was just like a completely different uh, feel than what I was used to yeah. uh, with the launch of that, that new redesign. Yeah. Um, so, so Dan, for, per your question, um, the Gore-Tex stretch, uh, you know, it is, it's a product of, you know, W.L. Gore and Associates. They, they pioneered the stretch Gore-Tex, which has always been, you know, that's one of the things that is a struggle for any waterproof, breathable laminate is how do we incorporate stretch. And so that material came about and was utilized in um, non-commercial applications. So military, uh, law enforcement, those kinds of things uh, where you needed a, a great amount of stretch to go over body armor or, you know, you, you, you wanted tighter fitting. But the mobility piece was interesting to me and mapping it in and and um certainly the the sh the swing of a shotgun especially in a layout blind scenario you're always you know you're always kind of off camber and trying to you know get them out yep. your hands. And there's a lot of pressure to 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 shoot well and have that mobility and so you know but the 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 whole package i think the topo the the stretch material is really one component of the system if you look inside that hudson where you start to look at the engineering that went into the the insulation package and the lining material that has to go along with the stretch on the outside you know what we created was a a, a jacket that allowed for that stretch and mobility across the back panel and the shoulders that that you know incorporates all these things so that you get that that kind of feel and, and yes, the, the stretch material on the panels on the back, you know, it, it you can see the tech and it's very vis, visual to, to say, oh, that, that, you know, I can see that. But if you look on the inside and you stretch that insulation panel, you start to realize, you know, we had to map insulation. There's, there's two different insulation types and three different weights of insulation in that jacket, in one jacket. And so... Sure. And then the lining material as well. So, you know, I think, uh, you know, again, we, we want to look at the whole problem and, and really get there. And the Hudson jacket has been a, a favorite for so many people. And I hear it time and again, um, you know, the Hudson jacket, the Hudson jacket. And, and, you know, it's a great jacket for sure. I, you know, I, I have a personal favorite. Uh, I wear the Hudson jacket. A lot of times I'm, I'm, I'm not able to wear uh, commercial product uh what when if depends on what i'm working on but you know in, in for the last couple seasons i haven't had a chance to wear the hudson jacket so i wore it you know prior to launch and and certainly uh year one since then i've been working on other projects and haven't had a chance to wear it nearly as much <laughs> you know i i'm gonna I, I should ask dan do you have anything else from throwback that you want because i want to talk about waiters that's what <laughs> so yeah, yeah. No, go, you got something go else with you it. Wanna get, 
right. Yeah, with that, I just, I just, that was just a, such a big, that was a no, the, the game Hudson changer. Jacket, the Hudson jacket is one of my favorite pieces, if not my favorite. I wear it more than any other piece throughout the entire season, with the exception of my Merino layers, because I wear those basically all year round. Amen. <laughs> but, um, uh, but, you know, the, the, the biggest shock to my Sitka system, metaphorically speaking, was when the waiter launch came out. Yeah. And, you know, that was a, a big thing because, you know, all over the internet for years, it was like, of when's Sitka going to do waiters? And yep. know, there'd be like this grainy photo in the background of somebody <laughs> standing in thigh deep water in Arkansas. Oh, and like, man. I think those are, you know, that might be the- you know. so, you know, <laughs> that was a big thing. And then they came out and, you know, tons of discussion, you know, went on with those and all that. And then this year, all of a sudden you see some sites with like discount Sitka waiters on it on sale. And people are like, is this some sort of like knockoff? What's going on? So that sort of like gave some clues that maybe there was something new coming, you know, this year, uh, or at least some updates or something like that. So uh, what, what, what are we, what are we dealing with here on the yeah. waiter line this, this fall? Yeah, I, it's, it's, so it's, it's, it's curious. I hear a lot of the discussion and, and I managed um, through the development process to keep it pretty, pretty well under wraps. We had a pretty extensive field test with a lot of people across the country. And, and, you know, water fouling is a social pursuit. It's, it's a lot easier to hide, you know, your prototypes in the mountains than it is at the boat camp. <laughs> and, so, yeah. so, and especially since we're all hunting with a number of people and everybody's got their cameras and, or, you know, and phones and taking pictures. And, and so, yeah, it's, you know, it can be challenging there. And, and I think, um, just the, how long it took to develop the waders and, and get them to where they are. Uh, I would suggest that the new, the update to the waders is not revolutionary. Okay. We have a tremendous product already. And um, I would refer to the things that we've done to the waders for fall of 20 as tweaks, you know, where we, we made some minor adjustments, um, but realistically, the laminate package stays the same. The 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 um, fit is largely unchanged. I don't know that anybody would notice the minor tweaks that we've made in that regard. But we, you know, we have had we have had some minor tweaks to um, certain areas of the waders just to to, to continue to make them better. Uh, the big change for the fall 20 is the boot. You know, it's, we, we updated the boot, um, continue to collaborate with lacrosse. They've been a tremendous partner. Uh, yeah. They do a great job with boots and um, have been so helpful in uh, developing and, and getting us samples and, and really not uh, taking too much control they've allowed us a lot of freedom and, and have been tremendous in that regard. So um, the, the biggest change that, that people will notice uh, with the waiters that are going to be available, it's just, it's the boot. And um, so let me ask you a question about that. And, and I think the boots a great example on how to phrase this question. So if you're developing a product like a waiter and let's say that's, I don't know, two, three, four years in the making sure. and testing and all that kind of stuff, Obviously, you know, if you're partnering with lacrosse on the boot, they're evolving their products while you're developing your products. So like, at what point do you say, um, okay, this is the one we're going with, even though they say, but we've got something in the pipeline that's going to be really great. And like, do you want to hold out and wait for those ones? And like, is, is that a, is that yeah. a, a factor that kind of goes into it? Or do you just say at some point, like, you know, we got to, we got to make a decision and, and move forward with it. And then obviously as something warrants it, you know, or meets the threshold that would be worthwhile yeah. to relaunch or do an update, then you do it at that point. Like it yeah. just seems like that would be a very difficult decision to make. Cause sometimes at some point you just have to say, sure. okay, we're going to production with these. Here we yep. go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, every scenario is a little different. Lacrosse has been extremely helpful and, but they've also not been very intrusive. You know, they have allowed us to, to do what we've wanted to do all along. And, and when we, when we set out to build waders, um, you know, lacrosse isn't the only company or, or, or boot manufacturer that we considered, uh, but certainly they have been and, and 
were at the time the best um, for a lot of reasons, but one of them certainly is that they've allowed us to, to do the things that we wanted to do. And, and you know, we, it's, it's been meaningful for both parties, uh, so much so that we're continuing to, to use their boot and, and we're, we're happy to have it. So I think the, the premise though, as you, as you look at, uh, the big things around waiters and the things that people should want to celebrate and continue to celebrate is, you know, you, everybody, everybody that that's listening to this podcast and every, you know, can empathize. You're going to wear out a pair of boots. You wear out shoes, you get new shoes. Boots are a wear item and having the ability to put new boots on your waiters it's just, it's a game changer. You know, why would you want to throw away your waders? It's an extension of your system. It's, so, it's just like everything else. Uh, I, I liken it to gear. You know, we, we, we refer to stuff as gear. Um, and I encourage people to think about it in that regard. You know, it's, it needs service. It needs maintenance. Uh, all, of, all of your garments and gear need, need those kinds of things. So to have a waiter that, that allows us to do those things um, and the new boot and old boot are completely interchangeable. So somebody wears out their, their waders now, you know, we have the new boot would go on. And, and that it's, it's a maintenance item and, and something that, that uh, people should expect to wear out. If you're out there hunting and, and really getting great use out of your gear, you know, boots, that's a wear item. And, and you know, I think people have to understand and, and get used to that because in the past, People are so accustomed. You have no idea how many people come up to me and say, man, I was, I was throwing away two, two pairs of waders every season. And, mm-hmm. and you know, I, I think that's just not good. And so, you know, yes, our waders are expensive. You know, it, it's an investment and we fully appreciate that, that what that is. Um, but at the same time, you know, so is your jacket, so is your shotgun, so is your boat. You know, but this is the the single most uh, important piece of gear when you start to go waist deep in water. You know, there's yeah. no there's no guessing whether I'm taking on water or not. Sometimes it might be a pinhole, but if you get a good uh, good failure, you know, and and it's not it's not if it's when. You know, if you're out there hunting, the conditions that waterfowlers are hunting are harsh, and I would say that barbed wires. People should not cross barbed wire fences. <laughs> yeah. Me included. Yeah. What um, what kind of um, updates to the boot uh, that that are going to set them different, you know, set them apart from what, what they uh, what they previously had? Yeah. So so really, it's a it's a construction method, mm-hmm. and um, the the neoprene saw or sock is what, what really what it comes down to is the same seven millimeter thick um, and the outer uh, rubber materials, a vulcanized rubber construction. And so what that'll give us, we still have to use um, a lofted style insulation sandwiched in that package. And so it just gives us the ability to uh, adjust the shape and the coverage. And and we've increased the coverage of the neoprene with this uh, new boot so you know you should have less exposure um the warmth should be comparable um yeah so it's i mean that's the primary difference is is the materials in the construction Uh, attaches is the same uh the the way we can take it off i had to take off a boot in my garage and and you know i could i I could pull off a a boot with a heat gun here in my garage and that's just not something not, not that i could put it back on (laughs) <laughs> but you know the fact that that they that it's able to be accomplished is you know we we just put so much into that development we don't you know and and it, it works great so you know yeah because that's one of the big things people had concerns about is like okay yeah i can send my waiters back to get uh service or warranty work done on them yeah but- uh, what if they're gone for six months? That doesn't mean, do me any good. And, you know, but having a, having a product that could be swapped yeah. so easily allows you to do it in a more timely fashion and get them back, get them back in business quicker. 
Yeah, and the, and the average turnaround time was was really good, uh, with the exception of the recent, you know, factory closures and different things. You know, I think we're in unprecedented times if we're, you know, in in all reality. And so, you know, there has been a delay, you know, after the season. And I think people did a lot of a lot of great things to keep your your waiters at, and every pair of waiters comes out with a field repair kit. And you're gonna see a video coming up soon. I did this video and they held off on on letting it go on field repair and leak, you know, identifying your leak and, and how to keep your 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 waiters in the field during the season because nobody wants to just send them in and 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 be without them during peak season. So how you know I encourage people, you know, there, there's, there are tools, um, you know, keep them in the field, do your field repair, send them in after the season. You know, if you have something that's hemorrhaged, you know, and, and you can't fix it on your own, then send them in by all means. And you have that ability. The, the factory that builds these waders, there's not, there's not a component on them that they can't replace. They can pretty much do, I mean, you truly have to wear out every part of it to, you know, and that's not to say that there won't be people that go through a pair of waders in their lifetime. You know, things will wear out, but for for all practical purposes, you put your hole in it or bust a seam or wear out a zipper. You know, all of that is completely doable to to be repaired, and and that happens at the the factory that manufactures those in the USA. I think something that goes to show just the quality too is the number of people that are field hunting in waders because they're so comfortable and they're Amazing. freaking dry the entire time. Like yes. you, know, you go out and you hunt with some people and you're like, I'm guilty. All right, I'm, I'm, I yeah. was, I did, <laughs> not, I, had, I did not anticipate that. Yeah. that was, I was like, I'm putting on my boots and that. boots and bibs and everyone's putting their waders. I was like, are we hunting water today? They're like, no dry field mallard hunt. I'm like, right. And you know, and they're, up and at them quicker than anyone else. Like, oh man, my I, gosh. I like, yeah. I ran into uh, a crew of hunters in Oklahoma this year, and it was they were they were field hunting for um, snow geese, and you know they three of them were sitting in this little diner wearing waders, <laughs> and I sat down and I talked to them. They had no idea, you know. I just. It, just wanted to talk to them about their gear, what, how they were doing hunting and stuff. And, you know, and, and to hear them talk, you know, I just, that, that's something that still surprises me. And I get pictures. I saw uh, Sean Stahl sent me a, a picture of his buddy that was going to Cole Bay, Alaska. And, and then he was going to uh, hunt King Eiders and on Island X, he wore his waders on the entire plane because he didn't want to lose them. Oh my gosh. That's awesome. Yeah. It'd be a little hard to take your shoes off when you go through (laughs) the security TSA. Yeah. (laughs) Well, I mean, the the planes and things, I guess, uh, weight's an issue and and they, you you leave your, they leave bags behind, but the waiters, if you're wearing them. Yeah, Sir, can wild. you take your waders off? Well, <laughs> all I all I have is a pair of merinos under this. Right, right. Yeah. I can borrow somebody's shotgun to shoot my king eider, but I'm wearing my waders. <laughs> oh my gosh! So, it, it, tell me that you ended up telling those guys in the diner that you designed what they were wearing, or did you just leave uh, it out I, there? No, I, I I'm a pretty modest guy. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not much of a name dropper. I, I I did tell them. You know, I appreciate their support that I work for Sticky Gear. <laughs> we didn't get into it very deep, and that was at the end when I was, yeah. So, and I, at the end of the day, I'm a, I'm a waterfowl hunter, and, and I just enjoy, you know, um, my wife says it's a curse. I like to talk to people, and I strike up a conversation, and it's it's not hard for me to do that. So <laughs> a full crew of guys, whether they're wearing sick or not, I still want to talk to them. Yeah, I, wanna, I wanted to circle back to something you said, because I, I – I don't know if a lot of people know this and I want to make sure that they hear it. Um, you mentioned that the waders are manufactured in the United States and that's something that you see a lot of people talking about online, you know, mm-hmm. buying products that are made in the U S and that's, you know, some people have, um, you know, have a lot of, a lot of feelings about uh, Sitka and having some, some of the garments, uh, you know, produced overseas and, you know, the waders being made in America, uh, I think is a, is a pretty cool thing. And you, you, t- you touched on it. Um, but 
how has you know you know when we were talking earlier it covid has been harder on you all um because of the with the products that you make here in the u.s versus overseas because you you know things have been shutting down for the last couple of months and that's got to be really challenging leading up to you know the launch um yeah. you know and kind of the time that you chose so just talk a little bit about that yeah i think i think so you know it, it i'm probably not going to give you the answer that you would expect from from this you know made in the usa when we set out to to create waiters uh, as with any product i will tell you that we produce our products in the best factories in the world and and i feel confident saying that it doesn't matter what region what country it does not matter the best factory of the world is where we want to be and you know for for waiters um and i feel great that we are building our waiters here uh, for a lot of reasons, not just because they're manufactured here. Um, it's because they can be fixed, they can be serviced, they can be maintained, and it gives us the ability to, to, to keep them um, and keep consumers in those waiters long-term. And, and so, you know, when I visited factories in other countries, great factories there too, um, you know, I. I try not to get too too deep in the made in the USA. I, I believe that wherever the best factory in the world is, is where we need to be. So, yeah, for, for waiters, we're, we're fortunate to have a great factory that, that uh, builds incredible uh, gear for other pursuits. They never, they, they hadn't, um, they don't produce waiters. They had made waiters in the past, but you know, they, everything they do is around protection. Um, for military as well as, as consumers, they do paddle sports and and but make great dry suits. And so my first experience with one of their products was a dry suit in a lake, uh, in a high mountain lake, and and you know that was the first product that I tested from this manufacturer. Yeah, that's an interesting perspective. I hadn't really thought about it in that regards, to be honest with you. Um, I mean, I think most people assume that because things are made overseas, that it's just because it's about the bottom line and that's the cheapest way to do it. Um, but being in the best factories in the world makes a lot of sense. And it's a bonus if you can do that, get that quality and do it in the United States. I mean, that's, I'm sure, sure. If that was, if all things were equal, sure. I'm sure that's about the, the, that a lot of companies would go, um, yeah. you know, but that's not always the case. And, uh, I think it's just an interesting perspective that I frankly, I hadn't really thought about much. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, it's good. I mean, we, you know, I think, I think that's just, how we've approached things you know we we want to be in the most capable best factories in the world and wherever that takes us and when we manage those supply chains very well we've got a great team to do that um so yeah california that's where we're making our waiters that's dan's home that's dan's home state he'll tell you all about home it state mm -hmm. grew up next to fergie nice no fergie fergie was my sister's friend i did swim with her in the pool name drop unlike you did <laughs> 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 nice. And I was also two years old. And her, my sister refuses to call her Fergie. She just calls her Stacy. So there it is. Nice. But let me, let me ask you one thing that yeah. I think is on a lot of people's minds, and this might be insider trading that is a question that you just don't want to answer. But whenever stuff comes out, you always leave people wanting more because – it seems like stuff gets sold out and people are waiting. And I don't Gosh. know, I don't know if that's a production or a kind of a, a mindset that you guys do, but it oh. always, it, it just always seems that there's, yeah. there's people that, that can't get what they want. Yeah. So, so when we, when we talked in 2014, I will tell you that the, the waterfowl category was really small and, yep. you know, it's a factor of growth. It's a factor of, of managing responsibly and, and building, you know, this business. Um, we never intend to play any games with running out. You know, it's, 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 it's that's, that's not the kind of consumer experience we want for people. We want consumers to get what they want. We want them to enjoy the experience and build their systems and, and supply them with those products that, that, that make their passion pursuit that much better. So, you know, I would like to tell you that, that 
it's it's just a matter of how how you know to buy and continue to grow and and service that demand it's been it's been quite a ride and we're extremely fortunate to do so 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 that's that's a good problem that's a good problem yeah, then. It, it's a, it is a good problem but it's tough at the same time and i think i think people have grown accustomed to it you talk about the july time frame when products start to drop and and i you know i people are going to start buying product when they can get it you know, I don't know that that's always going to be the case. We're we're certainly trying, and you know, I think I think we're doing better. You're seeing our availability um, for things. You know, even even waiters this this past year, there was there was waiters available. So I think I think that's I think we're in a good place, and we're going to continue to uh, get better. Yeah, there definitely was a, a better availability. I think. Hey, maybe more people are switching over and that's a, that's great, great news. And that's why you can't yeah. find it, but everything is seen, does seem to be catching up. So. Yeah. And yeah, extremely fortunate adoption of our, of our gears has been um, widely recognized and, and we're super happy um, to, to do that. And that's been a good problem. So I got a question for you. Um, I know people have asked me about this and um, I certainly kind of, I'm, I'm sort of in this camp as well. Um, is there a reason why you guys have not um, chose to offer more of the products in solids? I know a lot of guys when they're <laughs> waterfowl hunting, they're like, I love these pants. I want to wear them to work. I want to wear them yeah. to church. I want to wear them to, <laughs> you know, wherever, you know, and I, and I'm, I'm certainly, I'm, I'm I love you. it too. I'm sure you guys get, you get, yeah. get this thrown at you all the time. Um, so, I mean, you know, is there, is there a reason for that or is it just, um, you know? Uh, yeah, yeah. That's a tough, I wear grinder pants a lot, right? <laughs> I grind my mud color way grinder pants yeah. right now. Yeah. And if, you know, I think, um, we have some great solids and, and I think, I think, we're going to continue to grow that collection as well. And while it's, as you, you know, it, it's, it has not been a primary driver for us because we, we wanted to similar to what you're talking about in, in terms of running out and, you know, you still got to manage SKUs and, and productivity and, and right. buys. And, and so while, while it's, it seems great and the people that love it are, are adopting those things, um, that'll continue to grow. Um, yeah, it's just really a matter yeah. of how uh, we well, and I think it. one of the one of the things kind of where I where I find myself really uh, wishing that there was opportunities for more is, um, <clears throat> you know, some of the the pieces in the uh, big game line or the whitetail yep. line. I would love to wear waterfowl hunting, but my OCD doesn't allow me to mix patterns. So if it doesn't match <laughs> timber or my yeah. my you know my marsh pattern. If I had yeah. it in, in, you know, in, in solid, I could wear, uh, you know, waterfowl hunting, but you know, there's a lot of times where I just yeah. look at those pieces. I'm like, that looks really great. I wish I had that, but, um, you know, I, uh, so yeah, yeah. that's. No, I, th I think, you know, that, that there is, there's crossover in, in next to skin layers and, and yeah, for sure. intermediate or, or insulation and, um, those, those pieces. So, you know, I, I think, I think we're, where the utility works, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll leverage styles across categories. And, yeah. and that certainly makes a lot of sense. Uh, the solid component, I think, yeah, yeah, I would expect to see more solids as we move forward. Just like you're saying, people are asking for it and, and the demand is there. Yeah. I oh, mean, uh, the, the Kelvin light in the, in the brown oh, Kelvin light. Love that if, if I know yeah. if it's not going to rain, I that puppy's that coming with me. Nice. <laughs> nice. All right. So we've, oh, all right. So we were going to talk about a couple of new styles you want to hear about. Yeah. I was good. <laughs> I was just going to say, we, uh, you know, I don't know how long we've been on the phone or on the call, but I we've know. talked about a waiter bag and waiter and the new <laughs> waiter boots. So I know. Well, I got a couple other styles. I, I yeah. Think Let's hit, we it. Better hit cover us with it. The, you know, one of the, one of the number one concerns for, waterfowl hunters wearing breathable waders is how do I stay warm? You know, it's really cold. You have cold transfer and you're, when you're, you're in water that compresses around your legs and everybody understands that feeling. And so, you know, similar to what we've done in, in, you know, looking for product inspiration, 
we looked outside of, of waterfowl hunt and, and tried to understand, um, like for guys that are wearing breathable dive suits and submersion type applications. And, and you know, we, we developed a, um, it's, called, it's the gradient cold weather bib. And this is a bib bib that's designed to be worn on your waiter, but it's mapped. And so if you think of your gradient pants, um, this is a, is a similar approach, but twice the thickness of a gradient pant through the, the most critical, you know, mapped areas of your underweighter system. And what, what, what people need to understand is it's still breathable. It still has stretch, but what it doesn't do is if you look at different kinds of insulation, similar to a puffy jacket, like you mentioned, your Kelvin light, if you take that Kelvin light and you put it underwater in a, in a system that compresses, you lose that insulation. It's, it's the, the gap and your, 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 your compressibility. So to, to, to manage a uh, loft in, in a waiter application, we use a uh, compression resistant fleece material. So very lofty, thick, same, same concept as the gradient pant, only that much more for extreme uh, conditions and, and not just extreme conditions. You know, a lot of people that wear sticky gear wear it because they get cold easy, uh, where they're hunting, they, 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 they want to stay out longer, uh, manage their, their you know, moisture, all those things. So the gradient cold weather bib is going to be a great choice for folks that, that hunt late season um, in waders, maybe they're doing it in a dry field and they still want to wear their waders. So, you know, the gradient cold weather bib, I used to think it was just for in a water environment, but <laughs> maybe if you're wearing it out there. Um, but yeah, so, so great layering option there. And I think um, is going to be widely um, accepted by folks that get cold easy or, or hunting in a really cold environment. And, and with the water and the cold transfer and compression, you know, this will really help in those, scenarios so and you said there is stretch in, involved in that as well yeah yeah so so yeah similar and that that's where you get the comfort in in those kinds of things um stretch our breathable waders um you know they they fit the we have so many size offerings so you can actually now buy a pair of waders that fits so you get that mobility the last thing you want to do is hinder it with you know your layering system and so we're trying to manage that um, component, you know, so having this stretch with a great fitting pair of waders, um, not limiting you from, from being comfortable. So, you know, that's going to be a great add to our system. We did also update the gradient pant minimally, um, still has stirrups, still uses that same textile. Um, we did taper the legs and reduce, um, bulk in that cuff, you know, so for those that have worn gradient pants, in the waders, you know, if you get too many layers, it can be tight. So we reduce that bulk in that cuff, but um, still have the stirrups, still great. Um, yeah. So, so in the you know, in the bib, what how how does it go down around the ankles? Is that also a stirrup? So we did not use a stirrup for the bibs. The bib actually is mapped with a um, a I guess a lighter weight compression resistant fleece in the lower leg so that it has a lot of stretch. So we're able to amplify the stretch in that lower leg, but make it so it's snug. So it doesn't ride up when you put them on. Um, and, and we did not, we chose not to use a stirrup in that application because we were able to do it with the, uh, the stretch of the map textile. So really comfortable. Um, it's so, it's such a different looking product. When you see it, you're going to be like, whoa. Um, <laughs> yeah. I've, had, I've had experiences this past year where, where I, I, I got some of these for people that I was hunting with um, and they didn't take them off. They wore them the whole week, like wearing them around camp. And, and you're like, that's, I'm not sure I saw that coming either, but it just said. Uh, I was just going to say, when that comes out, the amount of videos with people with no shirts on, just the bibs oh, walking no. around. You know it's gonna happen. <laughs> you know it's gonna happen. Oh, I'm gonna just, yeah. Just, I'm gonna tune it's it like, out. It's like the the duck hunter's romper, Dan. You can yes. try that out. <laughs> oh god, yes. <laughs> Full leg. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So oh, man. so people that want to celebrate warm, uh, this is this <laughs> um, 
And then I guess the, the last product that we have is a new bag. Um, mm. It's called the Bayou Blind Bag. And, and really the premise here was that we had compartmentalized storage in the, in the base. So, so um, for guys that are taking their cameras out or, or just like the divider style storage, this is a great bag and, and completely welded construction top and bottom it continues to use a water resistant zipper so that i can have sliders to move around for the middle so that i have access easily but you could set this thing down in the boat and you know it's like a turtle shell kind of scenario where it's it's going to be fine so everything's welded to that the material similar to our full choke pack where we 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 uh created that material um, so that it could be welded and this takes just the welding and, and construction next level. So, our so is it a, is our it a backpack style? Production. Is it backpack style or is it like the more traditional style of, uh, it is, it is bag? still, it is still a backpack style. Okay. But it would sit like with the straps up and the, the, the back down is really how it's an access. So it's, it's it's bigger than a blind bag construction, um, but gives us great usable space and it gives you the ability to carry it out on your back. And and so a little different take on on the you know the product form factor factor from what most people think of when they think of a blind bag. Um, so it's it's a really cool product, and uh, this is one that took a couple of years to 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 get in terms of tooling and welding and instruction and all of those things it's uh, so for all the photographers out there yeah. what kind of what kind of camera slash lens combo can you fit in this <laughs> um so i've i've put uh you know a standard nikon um i shoot a 650 so so i'm still i'm a few years back uh, <laughs> 70 to 200 you know lens you know which is a great choice and you yeah. um, I think I run that 15 to 35 um, most of the time. So I like, I like the wide. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I tell you, it all fits in there and, and you know, it's, it's kind of nice to have that uh, structure. Um, And and the, uh, the bag meant as a flotation device. It's, it's, (laughs) it's got great weather protection, but it's not really built for stunts. (laughs) You know, blind bags seem to be something that get um, evaluated, I'll call it, yeah. uh, by the, the hunting community, uh, probably as thoroughly as anything. Um, I you know. know. You get, it's such uh, a personal piece of gear. It, it is. It really is, um, you know, one of those things. And, you know, for me, I switched to the full choke pack, and that was kind of like, before the backpack style was really a thing like yeah i wasn't doing a lot of layout blind hunting in the field but for me uh, i was doing a lot of like small boat uh watercraft backwater type stuff and i just liked it because i could throw it on my back and i knew that if like the bad day happened where i flopped in the water yeah heck was gonna be with me <laughs> yeah and i wouldn't have to worry about my camera like being gone yeah um, yeah, and and it just freed up floor space in the boat because I could just wear it right and sure. Um, and I never looked back when I when I yeah. switched to that style. Yeah, and um, I've you know obviously more and more of those styles have come to the market, but um, yeah. you know, th- that's obviously a an exciting thing to hear that you guys are continuing to develop and push that that concept even further than what we've seen already. So that's yeah. That's well, I, I certainly yeah. hope that that people um, appreciate it for what it is and. You know, it's, it's entirely different. You know, full choke pack is fantastic product. And I, you know, I, I use that product all year round. <laughs> I, and when I'm sporting clay shooting, I use a full choke pack and that's where all my gear is. And I switch out here all the time and there I am. But yeah, this is, this is definitely something that's uh, different than anything else. Cool. That's awesome. Dan, I do have that? a, I do have a, a half choke and a full choke in my truck at all times. Even Josh nice. calls it a locker, but it is organized in the deck system. <laughs> so relax, Josh, before you comment. But that's always <laughs> if we go hiking and three kids need their water bottles or whatever, I'm I'm throwing it on my back. But yeah, that's uh, I'm yeah, excited for that. Just to... messy. My truck is messy. <laughs> I, I got I got stuff straight across it. I have to I have to clean it regularly. 
Go ahead, Josh. Dan, Let it Dan fly. Should, Dan should clean his regularly, but he doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you should see it. He's got three car seats in the back. It's like a full house in there. Just bases loaded all the time. Every seat's accounted right. for. Just... What do you want me to do? Hey, hey listen. <laughs> uh, Dan, I can empathize. I've, I've got four kids. I grew up. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. You're living it too, yeah. I, that's right. My family is my family's quickly uh, moving along, but yeah. That's funny. I remember those days. Three, three wide on car seats in the back. Oh, it is. At least they're booster seats now, so <laughs> I don't have yeah. to carry. Hey, listen, when they get giant things, big kids, big problems. <laughs> yeah, you your blessings. Yours are still young right now. Yeah, True story. True story. I do enjoy that. So, no, I'm excited, man. There's a lot of good stuff, and just I, just one season. I'm. I mean, I'm sitting here and sweating. If you couldn't tell so glossy right now but i just want it to be cool <laughs> and freaking give me a cold front yeah. josh already and oh, let's get back yeah. let's get back you, out guys, I, you guys can't see in the background but i got the gas fireplace on it's been on all day so be, oh, careful. Wow. <laughs> be oh. careful i don't know that if we got in i think 50s we may have been in the 50s today i don't Jeez. know <laughs> wow wow that's yep. crazy um you know, one thing I wanted to ask is, um, as we're chatting here, and Dan and I have long uh, been fans of Beretta, and oh. you know, we we've been, um, you know, we've been eyeing up the A four hundred, you know, Extreme Plus, and obviously mm-hmm. I did the Torture Tour and stuff, and got to shoot it there. So, sure, uh, you know, those are definitely in our future. But we were surprised to see <laughs> you, <laughs> you rocking a Beretta hat here today. Oh so, Lord, yeah. You know, tell us what that's all about. Ah, uh, you're gonna get me in trouble. I got to, uh, a trip. <laughs> I hunt, and we talked about that Canada trip every year. I hunt with George Thompson uh, from Benelli, and he's yeah. he's their their product guy from Benelli, and we share a hunt. and And uh, I shoot and hunt with a Benelli. Actually, this year when I switched left handed, um, I hunted all year long with a 20 gauge, and didn't matter what I was hunting. Uh, from turkeys to big honkers to ducks to, you know, that 20 gauge is all I shot all year. Um, say, let's just stop for one second. Say that slowly again for people <laughs> to understand what you said. When I switched from right-handed to left-handed <laughs> shooting yeah. this year. I would like to all tell right. you okay, that made it more now. challenging for the ducks, but that wasn't the case. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm extremely left eye dominant. And so I'd fought that for 30 years and, and last year I shot a lot of sporting clays. Uh, it, it, it just kind of worked out that way. And um, I was working with a guy named Zach Keenbaum and one of the top sporting clays shooters in the country. And he, he just said, Jim, have you ever tried to shoot left-handed? And I said, I have, it's, it's kind of ugly, but I said I things. And so we, we, we finished that round of sporting clays shooting left-handed. And he said, you know what? He said, you'd be dumb not to give this a try. And he said, we're going to, he's like, I think you need to give it a year. And I, and you know, and that was so hard because it's so weird even opening a gun, you know, and dealing with the controls and I'm so right-handed dominant, but you know, I committed to it and, and I'll tell you, I've shot thousands and that's no exaggeration of thousands of rounds left-handed. Um, and you know, it's, I'm coming up on a year. It'll be a year in August, August 22nd, I think is the anniversary. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> decide whether I'm going to stay left or not. And you so give you your uh, left-handed yeah. coin there, celebrate one year. <laughs> yeah. So um, anyway, I, I shoot and hunt with a Manelli. Um, I love my M220 gauge and I cannot believe how hard that thing hits the 20 gauge with the shells you know, that are made, you know, um, gosh, I shot a lot of boss shells this year. I shot a lot of heavy, um, you know, pretty much shoot what I, what I need to, depending on where I'm at and and the situation, but, um, just shell technology is great. Um, reduction of recoil, but I will tell you that 20 gauge will do it all. If you're able to hit and, and be proficient, there's, you know, I'm not sure I'll shoot a 12 gauge again. I just, (laughs) <laughs> love that thing so much now on the sporting clay side you see the beretta hat i shoot a beretta for under and so uh, 
Oh, this is this is off season. I'm training with a over under, and and it's you know I I like shooting the over under. It's it's certainly for sporting clays. It gives me options, and um, yeah, I'll I'll switch back and and I do I do like my Benelli's for hunting. Sorry, Beretta. I do like I do like <laughs> for sporting. Sorry, Benelli. But you no, know, I you know it's different tools for different jobs, and um, the A four hundred is a terrific gun. You know, I, I, I have an SBE3. It's right-handed. I'm not shooting it much. <laughs> but the, the M2 lefty 20-gauge, my goodness, is that a terrific gun. So how's your shooting overall? Are you shooting better I'm, lefty than right? Yeah. I, I can finally say that um, at, you can – Ted's going to love me for saying this. We, I shot with Ted and Kevin Stevens – for his bachelor party, we, we shot around a sporting clays and, and I will tell you right, right now, and that's not cause I'm a bragger, but I beat them all left-handed. Oh, <laughs> that, that did happen. It's oh. not, so, it's not bragging if it's the truth. <laughs> uh, well, I, I say that because Ted is a tremendous shotgun shooter. He just is. And so, you know, I, I've gotten to a place where I'm, I'm really comfortable. I'm proficient and, and it's awkward now if I throw the gun up right-handed. So yeah. that, Wow. It's how much I've shot lefty now. It's kind of, it's kind of. It's I never, I never thought I'd say that. It was so awkward. Even, yeah, picking the gun up left-handed, shouldering it, all of that. Well, I mean, I can't imagine how it feels to battle having the, you know, the off eye, you know, the other eye dominant for so oh. long. Uh, oh. I mean, now it has to be like such a relief to just, you know, if it's starting Shoot. to feel a little bit normal. But at least you, you know, you, you're seeing naturally yes. what your body's telling you. It, looks like makes sense right yeah yeah and and i shot okay right-handed i just i had to shoot so much to to maintain some sort of proficiency and and i i I, basically zach said i was maxed out i was i was probably not going to get much better than where i was at and you know i was shooting i guess i high right-handed i was upper 70s you know so still you know pretty darn good for you know sporting clays you know I'm touching in the eighties now. So I'm, I'm just recently gotten to the eighties. So I'm really excited about. Yeah. Nice. That's awesome. I'm I'm pulling the handle on that reloader and pushing out a lot of shells to do it. (laughs) (laughs) No, that is, that is awesome. And amazing that you're having that much success. I think it'd just be weird. You know, so weird. The whole movements. And I think the the most weird thing would be, would it be actually pulling the trigger left-handed? I think that would, like, I would be. Robo Dan. Off, <laughs> Robo Dan. Yeah. That'd Everything about it. All the mechanics. Everything. Well, it's, about just, it. it's just like if you so try to hit the brake pedal with your left foot, you have no feel, no touch, right? Uh, like, it'd be the same way trying to pull the trigger left-handed. I feel like I would just smash it to the back of the trigger <laughs> guard, and, you know, just jerk it all over the place. Kind of, no, no it, I'm telling you, it was not pretty. It was not pretty. Yeah. No. Well, Dan, you got anything else? We've kept Jim for, for longer than I'm sure we promised him. Gosh, but. you might have to break this into two episodes. <laughs> That's a lot of stuff. <laughs> so cool. under these gradient cold weather bibs, I can still wear Merino. Correct. You can you can still wear a merino. All right, we're good. We're golden. I'm good, Josh. <laughs> All right, the world episode can, over. The Thanks. sun will rise again tomorrow, Dan. I assure you, <laughs> you will be able to wear merino. So, well, Jim, awesome. we're we're excited uh, to see these products coming out here in the real near future, and we're happy to have you back on the show. Uh, uh, let's make sure we don't. Time. Let's make sure we don't wait six <laughs> years to do it again. <laughs> Gosh, yeah, let's do it again. I appreciate it. You guys are great. Well, we appreciate you saying that, and uh, we definitely Thank encourage you, everyone to check out uh, all the new products that come to market, and I'm sure you guys will be killing it. And if we don't talk to you before the fall, we hope you, you know, hope you get your hunts in and uh, keep yeah. shooting left-handed, and we'll, we'll be watching your, your social media to see how many more wins you get over Ted left-handed. So we'll see. Oh, no. <laughs> he's gonna, I don't know he's that gonna I can take it to task now. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. I sure hope so. Yeah. Uh, all right, Jim. Good talking to you. Take care. Great. Thank you. All right. That's going to do it for this episode of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast. If you're new to the show, head over to iTunes, check out some of our past episodes. And while you're there, leave us a five-star rating and review. 
It's the best way for like-minded hunters just like you to find our show. Check us out on social media. Check us out over at hpoutdoors.com and anywhere you can find quality podcast content. That's going to do it for this week. Till next time, for Dan, I'm Josh. Take care. Take care.